So welcome to another session uh, of Haskell Love. And today we have uh, with us Vladislav. Vladislav Zavialov is among all, many other things, an active contributor to the Glasgow Haskell compiler and can teach us valuable stuff about Haskell from the inside out. Have you ever wondered what, what's going on between this magical word do that that's making uh, monads more tolerable? Or I guess you already know the question be, uh, behind it. Uh, I, I guess you already know the answer behind that question. Um, but what about infix operators or maybe type classes, type families, or some other, how can I say, complex looking features in Haskell? Unless you had the chance to, you know, uh, have a deep dive in uh, the compiler by yourself, it might not be an easy thing to answer. But Vladislav has already done that and will take us on such a deep dive. And he will help us understand what's going on whenever you, you write uh, GADT, for example. And it will lead us to a better understanding of the language we all love. And who knows? Uh, he might even help us realize we love the compiler as well, the GHC compiler. And we might even want to contribute something to it uh, as well. So um, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Vladislav. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me, see me, and see my slides. I'm Vlad. Uh, I'm a GHC developer working at Sirocco. In this talk, I want to share with you a very powerful way of thinking about programs and language features. The trick is to think about the way the Haskell code is desugared into core. Uh, but first, what is core and what is desugaring? Uh, the short answer is that desugaring translates a program that uses many different language constructs into a program that uses only a few. Uh, here we have a program that uses uh, list literals, operator application, and function application, and translate it into a program that uses function application only. The resulting program is harder to read, admittedly, but the building blocks used to write it are simpler. Um, now, for the long answer, let's talk about the position of the sugaring in the GHC pipeline. Uh, imagine you're a compiler, or if that doesn't work for you for some reason, imagine you're writing a compiler. Uh, so you need to process a user's program, uh, which is a string, a sequence of characters. Uh, where do you begin? How do you approach something like this? Uh, well, uh, the first steps um, are well known. First, we do lexical analysis. Uh, so we group subsequences of characters into labeled tokens. Uh, you can see the various token types, um, identifiers, equality signs, uh, parentheses left and right, operators, uh, numeric and string literals. So now we have a sequence of tokens. Uh, then we organize them into a tree. Uh, that's called syntactic analysis. The structure of this tree depends on the language we're working with. Uh, so in Haskell, uh, a module contains declarations, such as data declaration, class declarations, function definitions, etc. In this example, we only have two value bindings uh, marked as bind. Uh, a value binding contains a pattern, that's the left-hand side, uh, and, an, and a body, that's the right-hand side. Uh, and uh, the body is some expression. Uh, in this example, the patterns are, are always uh, just variable names. Uh, and uh, an expression can be one of many forms but here we have a function application, that's a function on the left and its argument on the right. We have operator application consisting of two operands and an operator between them. References to other named values, uh, those are marked as var uh, and numeric and string literals. So now we have a tree, uh, but in this tree, uh, every reference is just a string still. Uh, so we do name resolution to figure out which name refers to what. Here, print, plus, and length are imported from other modules, uh, but X is defined in the same module. Uh, so we have scope information, which I demonstrate with arrows here, but in the compiler, 
this is uh, recorded as unique identifiers. Uh, next, we do type checking. Uh, we analyze the program and infer the types of its expressions and sub-expressions. Uh, so here we infer that main is of type IO of unit and uh, bind is of type int. Uh, I'm sorry, X is of type int. Uh, and uh, that's the GHC pipeline, or at least uh, a part of it. Uh, that's the GHC front end. We convert text to tokens tokens to a syntax tree, then we add scoping information to the syntax tree, and then we add type information to the syntax tree. This gives us a well-scoped, well-typed syntax tree. And this is what we use as input to the sugaring. So the sugaring takes a tree uh, representing the source program uh, and converts it into a core program where core is a language. Uh, it's a language like Haskell but it's much smaller with fewer features. Uh, to understand in what sense core is simpler, uh, let's take a deeper look at Haskell first. To represent a Haskell expression, GHC defines a type called HSXPER. Uh, and if you open uh, GHC sources, uh, the compiler GHC HSXPER HS directory, uh, you will see it, you will see this data type. Uh, and remember how syntactic analysis creates a node for each sub-expression, and these nodes can be of different varieties, such as function application, operator application, variables, literals, etc. HS Expert has a constructor for each node type. We have HS var for variables, HS lead for literals, uh, HS app for function application, and so on. So, uh, in reality, there are lots and lots of these node types. Type applications, lambdas, let expressions, type annotations, list literals, operator sections, left and right, tuples, case expressions, lambda case, if, multi-way, if, do notation, record construction, record updates, uh, and more. Uh, I basically couldn't fit them all uh, in this slide, but uh, there's plenty. And that was just expressions. There are also patterns. There are types, there are declarations, which include data declarations, classes, type families, instances, and so on. You can browse uh, the compiler GHC HS directory to see all of it in your free time after the talk. Uh, so what about core? Uh, here's the entirety of its expression syntax. Variables, literals, function application, lambdas, lead bindings, case expressions, casts, types, and coercions. That's all of it. That's the entirety of core. If you learn these nine language constructs, you know core. So uh, core, um, if, if we know core and we know how Haskell translates into core, this gives us the ability to reason about Haskell constructs by thinking about the, uh, the core programs used to uh, desugar these uh, Haskell constructs. Uh, and for the purposes of this talk, we'll just pretend that core uh, is a subset of Haskell with minor deviations, uh, because in core, the uh, coercions, which are not present in surface Haskell, there are also strictness differences um, and so on, but mostly it's just removing parts of Haskell. So if you know basics of Haskell, you have a good head start to understand core. Uh, and if you want to learn more about it, here are some resources to learn about it in no particular order, but uh, that's for later. Now we pretend it's a subset of Haskell plus coercions. Uh, and let's look at desugaring. Uh, by example, uh, we'll start with the most basic features and progress to more complex ones. Uh, infix operators are translated into function application. Uh, that's trivial. Uh, now, but actually all variable occurrences in core have type information associated with them. So a more accurate translation would look uh, something like this. Uh, more often than not, I will not show the types to save visual space, but keep their existence in mind in core. Uh, every variable reference is annotated with a type. Now, bindings in core always have a single variable name on the left-hand side. 
uh, a function binding is the sugar into a lambda. So you can see here in the source program, the left hand side of a binding uh, contains two things, the name of the function and the argument of the function fx. But in the core program, to the left of the equality sign, there is only a variable name uh, because core doesn't support um, any additional syntactic sugar. We just uh, say that f equals to this expression. And there are also no separate type signatures. All type information is stored in lines. So in surface Haskell, we say that f has type integer to integer. Um, here, of course, in the binding, this is also recorded, but in the body, uh, we have uh, inline annotations on the x binder in the lambda and on the use of x. Um, again, I will not always show this on the slides because if I included all type annotations, um, much of the code wouldn't fit, but uh, keep in mind, it's, it's there. That's, why, that's also why we do the sugaring after type checking. We need this type information to uh, do the sugaring. Now, uh, multi-argument function bindings uh, are converted into nested lambdas. In core, all lambdas are single argument. Uh, if you ask GST to print out core, it will actually uh, pretty print it in a way that shows them as multi-argument for convenience. But in reality, the syntax tree that GST operates on in core, uh, all lambdas single argument. So that's simpler than Haskell lambdas. Uh, and um, I suppose if you've ever uh, dealt with Pure, with a no, lambda calculus, this should be familiar to you as carrying. Now, if you write a lambda by hand, same thing happens. They are desugared into a nested single argument lambdas. Now, pattern bindings uh, are a bit more interesting. Uh, so a single pattern binding can be translated into several core bindings. So here we have a binding for a tuple, binding uh, two values, A, and B, A is one and B is true. Uh, but in core, uh, remember there is uh, no pattern matching. Um, so we translate this uh, pattern binding into three. A, B binds the entire value. Uh, so that's the entire tuple, one and true. And then for its uh, constituents, we use case. Uh, case, uh, again, it's, um, while in surface Haskell case can do very fancy types of pattern matching in core, it has a straightforward operational semantics. It forces the argument to, uh, it forces the scrutiny to weak head normal form, and then it just compares the constructor tag. So it's more like switch in C than uh, full on pattern matching. But here we can of course use it to extract parts of the tuple. Uh, then operator sections are desugared into lambdas, uh, unless you enable postfix operators, in which case left sections are iter reduced. Then we have tuple sections, which are also desugared into lambdas. Uh, multi argument pattern matches are translated into nested case expressions. So in surface Haskell, we can uh, write a function equation which pattern matches on several arguments simultaneously, like here, we require both arguments to be true, only then uh, this function clause will be, uh, will, will run in runtime. But um, in core, uh, we have to bind each argument separately by a separate lambda, and then uh, scrutinize each uh, argument separ separately by a separate case expressions. So uh, once again, we see that um, the program gets uh, larger and harder to read, but the building blocks of this program are all trivial. It's just lambdas and cases. Um, now, a complex pattern match will the sugar into nested case expressions as well. So uh, in surface Haskell, you can see uh, that this pattern requires the value to be uh, the left data constructor of either, and then inside of it should be a just uh, data constructor of maybe, and then inside of it should be uh, an empty string. But um, in core, we don't have the facilities to do this in one line. Uh, we 
have only primitive constructs such as case expressions, uh, and we do it um, piece by piece. First, we scrutinize E, see that it's left, then scrutinize what's inside, see that it's uh, nothing or just, and if it's just, we see that it's an empty string or a non-empty string, um, and so on. So, lambda case extension, this should be uh, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, it's a lambda and a case. Uh, if then else is the sugared into a simple case expression, so simple in fact that it makes a question why if then else is in the language in the first place, uh, then multi-way if, uh, that's nested case expressions as uh, you would expect uh, the sig function. Now that's more interesting. It forces evaluation to weak head normal form, uh, but in core um, case expressions are strict. They force um, evolu uh, they force the value to uh, weak head normal form. So we can translate um, a sig call into a simple case expression in core, which is in fact what GHC does. Now, bang patterns are virtually the same thing as seek, as they are also translated into strict case expressions. Here, f is the identity function, whereas g forces its argument. So in core, f is just a lambda, and g is a lambda with an additional case expression. Uh, now, parametric polymorphism. Uh, that's, um, that's finally when we start seeing uh, parts of core which are not easily observed in surface Haskell. So uh, in core, uh, when you have a type parameter, it must be bound by a lambda as if it was a normal function parameter. So in surface Haskell, we have ID of X, but in the core program, we have ID of A, that's the type variable, and uh, the second argument is X. Uh, of this type A. Uh, so that's, um, that's uh, interesting. Uh, and when we use a polymorphic function such as ID, in surface Haskell, we just give it the value parameters. Uh, but uh, in core, we have two parameters, the type, param the type parameter and the value parameter, and we supply them both. So that's a type argument and a value argument, bull and true. Uh, type applications uh, are actually a part of core making an appearance in surface Haskell. Uh, so in core, you have no choice but to use type applications. In surface Haskell, it's an extension and you can either use it or not. Uh, for example, when you construct uh, a tuple of three elements, in core, you'd pass six parameters. First, the element types, bool, char, string in this example, and then uh, the elements, true, x, hello in this example. Uh, and wh why, why is this a valuable idea? Well, I've struggled for a long time to understand existential quantification, um, but as soon as I started thinking about existential type variables as data constructor fields, like other value level fields, um, it became all much clearer. So in this example, we have a type called E, uh, which stores a list of some elements of type A, uh, and the, the type variable A is existentially quantified. Uh, and then the len function, each uh, pattern matches on the make E constructor and it takes the length of access stored inside. Uh, but if you look at core, uh, the len E function, it takes uh, the, the E value, it scrutinizes it, but when it pattern matches on the make E constructor, uh, inside it finds two fields, a type level field um, a and a value level field access and then the length function actually needs them both as well. So maybe if you are facing uh, type errors from GC such as um, a scolum variable escaped its scope, uh, maybe what you should um, do, at least it helps me, is to think about the core that your program should generate uh, and whether the variables that are bound here 
are actually escaping their scope. Uh, I mean, if, if you don't know this implementation detail, the, the GCR message is fairly cryptic, but if you do, then it's, it starts uh, to make sense. Um, and um, I forgot to mention that uh, the, the type information, it's virtually stored in, uh, but a later pass removes it all. So at runtime, um, it is not present. It does not take any space. Now classes, uh, classes uh, are also, explicit in core, uh, their instances are passed as ordinary data, which we call dictionaries, class dictionaries. Uh, but there isn't that much special about them. Unlike type parameters, they are passed at runtime. For example, in this function, um, we have a num a constraint, but in core, uh, it's another function argument. Uh, this dnum is a value that contains uh, the implementations of num methods, plus, minus, and so on, uh, for the given choice of A. Uh, so while in Surface Haskell, it might appear that F has one parameter X, when we translate it into core, we have three parameters. The A type parameter, the dnum dictionary, containing the implementation of uh, num methods, and then the X itself. Uh, and this way, uh, you can start thinking about classes as basically the same thing as data types. So a class corresponds to a data type and its instances correspond to values of this data type. And I mean it quite literally. Um, uh, when you define a class instance uh, in Surface Haskell, uh, the translation into core just binds uh, another value. It's value binding, um, constructing the dictionary for the class. Uh, and when you use a polymorphic function with a class constraint, such as uh, plus here, you need to give it the class dictionary. Uh, that's why it's called dictionary passing, because it goes to downstream users um, in, in the in the call stack. Um, now, do notation. Uh, let's see how the things uh, we've just discussed play out in do notation. Every bind corresponds to a use of the bind operator. So that's a normal bind, and that's the bind operator in the translation. But we know that in core, there are no operators. So it's not quite core yet. Um, and also the bind uh, function, it's polymorphic. So it will have type parameters, which we will need to pass to it. And uh, the monad class dictionary, we will also need to pass to it. So the actual core looks like this. Uh, first, F is going to take a type parameter M of kind type to type. Then it's going to take a dictionary of the monad class which is basically a normal value in core. Uh, and then it's going to take the monadic action itself. Uh, I'm sorry, there is a typo in the type. I, I think it should say mbool. Uh, anyway, uh, the rest of the function is uh, quite similar. We have the, the bind function, chaining monadic actions, but we also supply all the required information to it. Uh, so while do notation may seem uh, quite uh, mysterious at first, involving many features such as uh, classes and uh, parametric polymorphism. Um, and uh, also there is the, the additional sugar on top, the denotation. Uh, but if you, if you do sugar it into core, that's just lambdas and function application. And there is not much more to it. Lambdas and function application, all familiar constructs. Um, now, the extra feature of core, which I mentioned, uh, is called coercions, and uh, pretty tied to coercions are casts, and those are not present in Surface Haskell. Um, but, but one way to observe them in the generated core would be to write a program that uses equality constraints. So uh, let's do just that. Let's uh, start with the identity function uh, and uh, spice things up by adding a type equality into the mix. So this variant of ID, it uh, 
doesn't take A to A, it takes A to B, but it also requires a proof that A and B should be the same type. So that's an equality constraint. Uh, and when we translate it into core, remember, we do everything explicitly into core, uh, in core. So there are two gaps to fill. Uh, of course, we bind the type variables A and B, but then there will be some sort of binding for the equality constraint. How do we represent the equality constraint in core? Uh, and then after the value level argument, uh, we cannot simply return it uh, because as you can see, the value level argument E, it's, it has type A, uh, but the result must have type B. Uh, and uh, this is just not going to uh, fly in core. Uh, in surface Haskell, the type checker figures out that if we have the equality constraint, then A equals to B and uses that. Core doesn't do such reasoning. Uh, course type checker is very simple, very straightforward. We will need to explain uh, such things to it manually. So the first gap uh, is where coercions come into play. They serve as evidence of type equality. If you've got a coercion uh, called co here of type A equals B, that means that whenever you have something of type A, you can get a B out of it or when you have a B, you can have you can get A out of it. Uh, but you will need to use this coercion. Uh, so that's the, how we fill the second gap. The second uh, uh, core specific construct is called a cast, and a cast basically makes use of the coercion to convince the type checker that all is well. So this E, which is of type A, after we cast it using the coercion establishing that A equals to B, we get uh, this expression of type B. And that's, that's what we promised to return in the return type. Um, now, what's interesting about coercions is that you can put them in data constructors. We've already seen how existential uh, quantification uh, becomes clearer when you think about type variables stored in data constructors. But if you think about coercions stored in data constructors, that explains GADTs. So uh, make G here, it contains um, a value of some type A, but it also contains a proof that A is int. So the function F uh, promises to take G of any A, this A can be, uh, uh, so, so at U sites, of course, uh, this will be of type G int because that's the only possible way to construct a value of type G. But um, at definition side of F, we don't know what A is. We make no assumptions about it. And yet we promise to return an int. Uh, and when we pattern match on make G, in addition to n, which is a value stored inside, uh, we also get the knowledge that this n is of type uh, int, which we get by using this equality constraint. Now in core, uh, f uh, also makes no assumptions about the a given to it. So it says, uh, I will take g of a for any uh, arbitrary choice of, a, of the type A. Uh, and when we scrutinize G, uh, now that's where we get a coercion stored inside. So that's the coercion that we can use when we need to prove that A is in fact not an arbitrary type. The only possible uh, choice of A that the user could have given us is int. So, um, this n, which is of type A, an unknown type A, when we cast it using the coercion, we get something of type int, and that's the type we promised to return. So uh, coercions also explain type families. So in surface Haskell, we define a type family, let's say f of A, and we define a type instance uh, saying that f of bool equals to string. When we translate this 
type instance into core, what we get is a coercion. Uh, FBool string here uh, is a coercion defined as an axiom stating that FBool equals to string uh, by definition of F. And whenever we have some, um, let's say, function taking F of A as input, uh, and we want to give it a string, um, but it expects f bool. We can use this coercion uh, to cast the the input and um, basically satisfy the type checker. So uh, the coercion language uh, it's actually fairly complicated, uh, but the specifics are more of a technicality. All all you need to know about it, unless you're working on the formalism, is that it's a proof language of GHC. So whenever uh, in core where everything is explicit, we need to prove to the type checker that some type is equal to some other type. Uh, then we will construct a coercion proving that uh, and pass it or store it in a data constructor um, and then use it in a cast. So that was it. Um, I hope that uh, this quick look into core um, g gives you the uh, gives you a start. If you want to think about GHC's features, if you're reading the GHC manual and you str struggle to understand some feature, or if you're uh, working on a GHC proposal, uh, then uh, just thinking about the translation of this feature into core uh, should be insightful. Thank you.